We are inside the submersible Titan, which is a carbon fiber and titanium sub that can go to the depths of the Titanic. Hi, my name is Stockton Rush. I'm the CEO and founder of OceanGate. Let's take a look at Titan. So we're coming into the sub. This is the only toilet available on a deep diving submersible. Best seat in the house. You can look out the viewport. We put a privacy screen in, turn up the music, and uh, it's uh, very popular. We have our uh, control screen here, our sonar screen here, and we can put any image we want in the back. We've taken a completely new approach to the sub design, and it's all run with this game controller and these touch screens. So if you want to go forward, you press forward. If you want to go back, you go back turn left, turn right, go down, go up. And it's Bluetooth, so I can hand it to anybody. And it's meant for a 16-year-old to throw it around and super durable. We keep a couple of spares on board just in case. This is the second year we've been out to the Titanic. Uh, we went out in uh, five uh, eight-day missions. We did uh, about 10 dives to the wreck site of the Titanic, and we did an extra dive on an undiscovered reef that we found. Completely privately funded um, operation, and we're funded by what we call mission specialists who help support the mission. So they take quite a bit of money to come and join us. Years ago, they t the uh, Russians took tourists out to the uh, to the Titanic, uh, and it was just sort of a look and see thing. We really are focusing on the science around it. We want to document what the wreck is like now, and also try to predict what it'll be like in the future. It's continuing to decay and it seems to be accelerating. It's being eaten by a bacteria, so it's literally being eaten by the ocean. It's not rusting away. So these things that, that are called rusticles are actually the, the byproduct of a bacteria that eats the iron. And as it does that, these, these uh, decks are collapsing. The promenade deck continues to collapse forward. Uh, we saw some of the railing is starting to, to, to lose its structural strength, which is really a sad thing. That's when it's going to stop looking like the Titanic. The interest in the Titanic is the reason we go there, because people are willing to fund this kind of exploration and science, and that gives a completely different research component that almost nowhere else in the deep ocean can, can you get funding to go back every year for decades and see how coral reefs develop and see how, uh, how metals decay and see how currents change. I mean, that just, you, you can't justify that. No government will pay for that. Nobody wants to go back to just some old reef, but people do want to go back to the Titanic. And that's why we go, is because people want to go. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a submarine is self-sufficient. That means it has the power to leave port and go back on its own. However, a submersible needs a mothership to launch and to return to and for support and communications. Director James Cameron has logged dozens of dives down to the Titanic in a similar sized sub. But he's also been much deeper, 11 kilometres to the deepest point of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. I was lucky enough to meet him on that expedition in 2012. You're in a place that's so remote, nobody can come and help you. I mean, if I got into trouble in Earth orbit, we could always ask the Russians to come and help us, or even the Chinese. There's no, there's no help where, where we went with this vehicle. His dive would not have been possible if it wasn't for an Aussie, Ron Allen. A TV technician by trade, Ron built the sub for James Cameron, much of it in his garage in Sydney. The challenge for Ron, designing something that could withstand the enormous pressure so far beneath the surface. Submarines are quiet, deadly and expensive. Submarines come in two main types, diesel powered conventional submarines and submarines that run on nuclear power. The U.S. Navy's underwater ambitions since the 1950s have been driven by nuclear. A nuclear-powered submarine can stay out to sea for months and has almost unlimited range. Combined with nuclear weapons, this makes the Navy's so-called boomer subs some of the deadliest boats in the history of humankind. The Navy specifically has a very important part of this job. Its ballistic missile submarines carry a substantial portion of the U.S. nuclear warheads. But even these billion-dollar boats have a set lifespan. Los Angeles-class attack submarines and Ohio-class ballistic missile and cruise missile boats are getting older and they need to be replaced. Our friends in Indonesia suffered a terrible tragedy uh, in the last few weeks um, with an old submarine. You know, we don't know what happened yet, but the older a ship or submarine is, the more likely it is to suffer an accident at sea. The Navy has ambitious goals for the future of the fleet, but some problems could stand in the way. Now the state of Navy shipyard infrastructure is 
not great. On the way out the door, the Trump administration said over 400 ships in the Battle Force fleet plus 130 or so unmanned vessels, so a total fleet size of over 500 ships. Building ships is hard, and crafting a vessel for war is even harder. Boats like those in the Virginia class, which is an attack submarine, can cost $3.4 billion and take seven years to build. These views are my own. Certainly, I don't represent the Department of Defense or the U.S. Navy in, in any uh, capacity. Submarines are really right at the center of fleet design, um, partly because that's an area where the U.S. still considers itself to have kind of an uncontested advantage. And since the 1950s, the Navy has relied on companies such as General Dynamics Electric Boat and Huntington Engels Industries to produce these nuclear-powered underwater weapons of war. A Navy is a, a long-term project, uh, and it requires some, some real um, kind of visionary leadership to ensure that the fleet remains relevant in the capabilities that it has, and that we continue to replace ships as they get older which is why the U.S. Navy has what is known as a 30-year plan. To build these ships, the U.S. Navy needs shipyards operating at full strength. Right now, the Navy is go undergoing a 20-year plan uh, that costs $21 billion to upgrade its infrastructure. They've, they've been underfunded uh, for the past you know, couple of decades, as have been other, other priorities. Uh, and right now, we're hitting a point where there are very significant maintenance delays. The U.S. Navy currently has 68 submarines in service, and the Navy wants to start shipbuilding on two to three Virginia-class subs per year and roughly one Columbia-class per year until around 2035. The Columbia-class is a ballistic missile submarine, capable of launching nuclear weapons thousands of miles. It's a crucial part of American nuclear policy. The Navy estimates that it'll cost $109.8 billion for 12 boats. But experts at the U.S. Government Accountability Office remain concerned about the ability of the U.S. to build these boats with current shipyards and suppliers. How large the Navy can become and how many submarines it can build are all controlled by the defense budget passed in Congress. There is, there is a very real conversation that has to take place about where our budget is prioritized. Um, this roughly one-third mix going to the Air Force, the Army, and the, and the Navy doesn't really suit our strategic reality. And from fiscal year 2015 to 2019, uh, those shipyards completed 75% of maintenance periods for submarines and aircraft carriers too late, you know, over time. And that accounted for over 7,000 days of maintenance delay. Uh, so the Navy is trying to fix that. They've made some progress in the last uh, two years, but there's still a lot of work to be done. If the Navy messes up a 30-year plan, the consequences could be devastating. China's shipbuilding capabilities have skyrocketed in the last two decades. Chinese shipyards have been churning out commercial ships and military vessels at a rapid pace. This has left the U.S. Navy with a dilemma on how to allocate precious tax dollars to keep up. China operates a mix of nuclear subs and conventional subs, but its navy also operates mainly close to its own shores. That means the range of Chinese submarines is less of an issue. Our nuclear strategy is different, it's um, specific, and to sustain it, we need a triad. The nuclear triad refers to the three main ways that the U.S. could deploy nuclear weapons, by land, by air, and by sea. Um, the Navy specifically has a very important part of this job. Its ballistic missile submarines carry a substantial portion of the U.S. nuclear warheads, um, and it is the most survivable leg of the nuclear triad. So once a nuclear submarine is out to sea, it's sailing in the middle of the Atlantic or the Pacific Oceans, it's nearly impossible for an adversary to detect that. This is why replacing existing Ohio-class submarines armed with ballistic missiles is such a big concern within the U.S. Navy. So the Columbia-class submarine is the ballistic missile submarine. The, the goal is a, a 2028 delivery to the Navy and early 2030s you'll start seeing them, uh, you know, subbing in for the Ohio class. Uh, the Ohio class uh, started, the first one was delivered in 1984. Uh, those have a 42 year lifespan. So we're starting to hit the end of, of, of their lifespans and you know, the Columbia, getting the Columbia class out there, uh, as I mentioned, is the Navy's number one priority. In early 2021, the U.S. Government Accountability Office expressed concerns that the new Columbia class could take longer than expected to build and also cost more than initially expected. That could put the Navy in a very tough spot. So modern SSKs uh, are very, very quiet, and that's an incredible advantage that's 
really kind of been one of the game changers in, in recent decades is the rise of these very, very stealthy SSKs. For, for a submarine fleet that, that does operate closer to home, that, that's great. You know, you, you're getting very similar bang for the buck, but it just stays closer to home. That's the biggest downside to conventional submarines. They can't stray as far from shore as their nuclear counterparts, and they can't stay out to sea for as long. But uncrewed submarines, also known as unmanned underwater vehicles or UUVs, could be able to help solve this problem. Unmanned underwater vehicles, UUVs, um, so these are basically drones that can either um, travel on the surface or underwater for long durations. Russia has already been working on an uncrewed nuclear-powered submarine that is also potentially armed with nuclear weapons. This uh, submarine drone was one of several um, you know, exotic nuclear weapon systems that President Putin announced a few years back. Um, the motivation for these is kind of puzzling. The US Navy hasn't invested in this kind of risky technology yet, but other types of uncrewed submersibles could be part of the future fleet. For now, nuclear-powered attack submarines, ballistic missile submarines, and cruise missile submarines will continue to be the primary force that the Navy uses to project underwater power around the world. As we talk about the growth of the Navy moving forward, that is, lar that is largely fueled by more submarines. You know, Congress is concerned about the length of the Navy's plan to revitalize its public shipyards. And, uh, you know, to to meet that you know, recently proposed bill led by Senator Wicker, $25 billion, uh, 21 of which would fund the PSYOP, uh, $4 billion which would go to the private shipyards. So the idea being that they could help the Navy speed that up. How the defense budget shakes out in Congress could mean the difference between building one Virginia-class submarine per year or three. And some politicians have pushed for fewer ballistic missile submarines as part of a hard look at the size of the U.S. nuclear deterrent. In a request for comment in reference to a Congressional Budget Office appraisal, the Navy said that, quote, focusing on improving productive capacity via initiatives to increase on-time delivery and operational availability while reducing maintenance costs. The 2018 Nuclear Posture Review highlighted this idea of hedging against an uncertain future. Um, our adversaries are increasing their capabilities all the time. The United States is increasing its capabilities all the time. Technology can rapidly change. Um, so we need to build a nuclear force that um, we design our nuclear force to last for decades. People from the Army are, you know, soldiers feeling like I'm trying to take their budget away for my service. You know, but it is, it is really a very, it's a bigger issue. It's not a competition. It's not a rivalry. 